Spider-Man swings back into theaters this week with Spider-Man Far From Home. That means today I'm gonna stop and rank all nine Spider-Man and Venom films from the worst to the best. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Sean Chandler, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place. Consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all nine films. My list isn't the right list. It's just my list, and I would love to see yours. One final thing before we get started. This video is sponsored by Kernel. Kernel is a smartphone app that lets you track your favorite upcoming film release dates and gives you all the information you need including a synopsis, trailers, and more. You can add movies to your watch list and the app will send you notifications when the movie is about to hit theaters or release on digital or Blu-ray. There's also the Kernel blog, which gives you access to read the latest movie news, great in-depth movie reviews, and to top it all off, the best movie wallpaper you'll ever find. If you love to talk movies too much, you need this app and you can download it for free from the App Store using the link at the top of the description. With that said, let's get started. Coming in in last Last place is The Amazing Spider-Man 2. This is just a classic example of what happens when you have too many cooks in the kitchen and the studios mandate too many plot points to set something up in the future. The frustrating thing is there's a lot of great things about this movie. Almost all of the performances, I think, are really good. And the actual interactions between the characters, I thoroughly enjoy. Likewise, there's a lot of very well-staged action scenes sequences inside of this film where they do very wide shots, they do cool uses of slow-mo in environments that are very interesting, but the movie as a whole just does not come together because there's way too many things going on in competing value sets, competing tones, and competing objectives for the film. And so when you put it all together, it just kind of feels like this Frankenstein monster. There's just way too many main plot lines, villains, and subplots happening for any of them to be fully developed. In fact, Andrew Garfield, right after the movie was re released, made comments about, yeah, a movie and a story just can't really work if you just start cutting away a last minute in the editing room, and that's kind of what the movie feels like. And then on a tonal level, the relationship scenes feel very grounded in human, and this is contrasted with campy villains. You got the rhino driving around with Paul Giamatti just <laughs> which I'm not really even sure what they were going for there. And then Electro feels like he was plucked straight out of Batman Forever and dropped into this film. And they go so overboard on how nerdy he was and do goofy stuff with his powers like it fixes his teeth that it makes the film very hard to take seriously. And it's a real shame that Mark Mark Webb was never just kind of given the freedom to tell the story that he wanted to tell without Sony just jumping in and messing the whole thing up. Next up is Venom, and this is probably the most divisive film on this entire list because I know a bunch of you absolutely love this film and just find it incredibly entertaining, and then a lot of people hate this film for all of its plot issues. I can kind of agree with both of you that there's a lot of inter entertainment value here, especially in Venom's hijinks and the weird bromance <laughs> between Eddie and Venom. All of that works. And then the specific story going on here, it, it's just all over the place. The first 35 minutes of this film while they're trying to get to Venom is clunky at best in a very odd pacing where it both feels like they're rushing to get to Venom, but at the same time, it feels like they chose a very long route to get there with some very strange detours. Likewise, they couldn't really decide what the tone was gonna be for the film because sometimes it's like a bromance, other times it's like a horror film, other times they're just trying to be heroic. It's got crass humor, it has very corny humor inside of it. It is just all over the place, just like Eddie's psychological state. But at the same time, there's something endearing about this film in just how bonkers it is and how much it just 
goes for it and it doesn't care whether you're talking about people's heads getting bitten off, the way that they, the performance of Tom Hardy inside of the film, the way they decided to have the relationship between Eddie and Venom visualized on screen. There's a bunch of things here that I do really enjoy about this film. At the same time, I can't say it's a good film. It's just a very fun film. Coming in in seventh place is Spider-Man 3, another victim of Sony's meddling. Sam Raimi has been very open about the fact that he wanted to make a movie where Sandman was the villain, but Sony dictated that Venom had to be inside of the film, and instead of trying to kind of balance all of this out with kind of New Goblin coming into the mix, and when you put this all together, you get an overcrowded film where none of the plots get fully developed, and you can really tell that Sam Raimi wasn't very interested in doing the Venom storyline and just kind of squeezed it in there because he was told that he had to. Likewise, the film feels like you've got a great team that knows what they're doing, but their creativity is running a little bit on empty. So they're trying to kind of capture some of the emotions that worked in the first two films, but they do that by going back to the exact same places that they did before. So you've got more relational trouble between Peter and MJ. You've got more relational conflict between Peter and Harry. Once again, we go back to the death of Uncle Ben and we retcon that in to work in a new villain to try and touch on those same exact emotions and when you do that, it just starts to feel a little bit stale. Sam Raimi himself has repeatedly stated over the last 10 years that he was very unhappy with how this film turned out, and he doesn't think that he gave his best effort here, and he's disappointed that this is where the franchise ended. With all that said, it still has some of the magic of the first two films. It kind of rides the wave of what was created by those films, and so certain things still kind of touch the right emotional notes. There's still some fantastic action inside of these films. It's not the disaster that some people make it out to be or remember it as, but it is a disappointing end to a great trilogy. At number six is The Amazing Spider-Man. This is a film in a franchise that I think always had a little bit of an identity crisis. Mark Webb and Sony weren't quite sure what do you do with Spider-Man after how iconic Raimi's trilogy was? How do you distinguish yourself from those films that did such a traditional take on the character? So they chose to make a film that was more serious and grounded. I mean, it's not really grounded. And they ended up with a film that's good, has a great cast, but lacks a sense of intrigue. To distinguish itself, they kind of went with the more teen angsty direction. It's a little bit darker, more scenes are set at nighttime. And then they added in this mystery about Peter Parker's parents and what were they up to. But I don't think those are things that actually add much to the Spider-Man character. Now, I love the cast here. I think they have great chemistry with one another. And one of the things the do movie does really well is that none of the characters feel like they're acting in a comic book movie. They feel like real people talking about real things, and there just happen to be fantastical things happening all around them. And then, you know, Dr. Connors is the lizard is good, but he's not great. And that seems to be the problem with the film is that there's a lot of things that are good about it, but not a lot of things that go to that great level. Not a lot of things that stand out, even the action inside of it. The library sequence is really cool, and there's a great cameo from San Lee in there, but in general, it just kind of happens and it doesn't stick in your mind. And that's the truth about this film overall is that it doesn't have a lot of really low lows to it. It also doesn't have a lot of really high highs and ends up being basically the most forgettable film on this entire list. Next up is Spider-Man Far From Home. I've heard a lot of people like praising this movie as possibly the best Spider-Man movie. I'm not quite there with you. I think it's a very entertaining film, but not quite top tier Spider-Man. Right off the bat, this is a movie that does a great job of bridging the gap between Endgame and this film. They found some really clever ways to efficiently inform us of what's been going on in ways that are funny, but also make it really clear the dynamics of the world that we're in and the type of scenarios that would have unfolded. This is also a very funny film. One of the funniest films in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Likewise, each of the action sequences in this film have something distinct and unique about it that makes them interesting and memorable, especially the one that happens at the S.H.I.E.L.D. base. That is a very cool sequence and unlike anything we've really seen inside of a Spider-Man film or 
a comic book movie in general. Where this one started to kind of lose me a little bit, where I got a little bit more mixed, was somewhat in the villain situation. In general, there's great things that happen with the villain with this film, but at the same time, I think there's a motivation problem. There's a gap inside of the motivation that held him back a good bit for me. And likewise, the plot device of the glasses inside of the film, I think stretched a little bit too much credibility. Likewise, this feels a bit more like an MCU comedy with Spider-Man in it than an actual Spider-Man movie. And I hope moving forward that they're able to take this version of the character in a bit more of a traditional direction. Still, this is a very entertaining film with some great moments with the characters, standout action sequences, just some plot issues in there for me. In fourth place is Spider-Man 2. Now I know a a lot of you absolutely love this film and you have it as your number one and that's awesome I totally respect that it's a great movie that I have mostly all positive things to say about it right off the bat it's a movie that I think does a great job of continuing the themes of the first film and expanding upon them all these ideas of the cost of being a superhero and just trying to be a person in all the ways that it hurts Peter Parker in the process and then also hurts Spider-Man, the superhero. Doc Ock is another great villain who has a good heart, who's trying to do the right thing, but is driven mad by his sights, but gets a little bit of redemption in the third act of the film. And finally, this film has some fantastic action, especially the train sequence that I think is one of the best directed action sequences inside of any comic book movie, as it works as an action sequence, but also has a lot of heart to it. And it turns the city of New York into a character itself and kind of relates their relationship with with Spider-Man in ways that I think are very powerful. But the reason that this one is at number four for me is that I've just never bought into the plot line about Spider-Man losing his powers for psychological reasons. I know it works for a lot of you, but every time I watch the movie, the way it's executed, the way it's handled, it just rings hollow for me, and that holds the movie back a good bit for me because that's such an important plot point inside of this film, and it does not work for me. Still, it's a great sequel, it's a great movie, and if there wasn't so much competition with other Spider-Man movies, of course this would be higher up, but there's a lot of really good Spider-Man movies. Real quick before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking of the Spider-Man movies down below in the comment section. We're going to disagree. I know a lot of you love Spider-Man 2. That's awesome. Just don't be a jerk about it. Also, after this video, check out this video I put out yesterday about eight canceled Spider-Man movies. I spent a ton of time on it. I hope you check that one out. It's one of my favorite things that I've ever done. In third place is Spider-Man Homecoming, a refreshing look at both Spider-Man and the superhero genre because it leans in heavily into the fact that Peter Parker is a high schooler. That gives him this unique look at the world of the MCU in general and what it would be like to be an Avenger from the perspective of a high schooler, but likewise, it gives a different take on the superhero genre as he acts like an immature, naive, kind-hearted, good-natured high schooler that has superpowers. He's awkward, he hangs out with his friends, he has to go on school trip, but he has to balance all of that with the fact that he's friends with Tony Stark, Iron Man, and he might potentially be an Avenger. That's such an interesting dynamic to do with this genre. Likewise, it's a very different take on Spider-Man. It's true to who Peter Parker is, it's true to who Spider-Man is, but it also avoids a lot of the imagery that we've seen repeatedly of Spider-Man swinging from skyscrapers and working for the Daily Bugle, J. Jonah Jameson. And so you get to see the character in a different phase than he's typically been inside these films. And I liked the novelty of that. And finally, I find the Vulture to be one of the best villains inside of the MCU or all of the Spider-Man films. And of course, Michael Keaton is such a great actor. And whether he's being the charming dad, the guy in the suit, or the guy in the car with the gun, he's great at all of it. And it's wonderful to see him on screen. Now, I do have some issues with just how technology-based Spider-Man is inside of this film, and I don't think that really added that much to it, and it did detract a little bit of the distinctives of who Spider-Man is, but in general, this film is an absolute blast and one of the most rewatchable films inside of the MCU. Our runner-up is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. This is not only one of the most unique and creative Spider-Man films ever made, it's one of the most creative and unique superhero films ever made, it's one of the most creative and unique 
unique animated films of all time in that they found a way to take the format of comic books and the visual style of them and translate it to the screen in a way that we've never seen before. And part of what makes this movie so special is it does such a different film while staying true to the fundamentals of what you want from a Spider-Man movie in that you've got a great story about a teenager gaining great powers and learning with great power comes great responsibility. But it also turns everything upside down and goes totally bonkers and you got Spider-Ham, you got standout Spider-Noir, you got Spider-Gwen, and then my personal favorite, Peter B. Parker, an aged Peter Parker that has made some mistakes along the way. He's kind of depressed, he's kind of gained some weight, but it doesn't change the fact that he's a hero at heart. Now online, I've seen a lot of people compare his storyline to Thor's plotline inside of Endgame as a defense of Thor in Endgame. And I, I, there's obvious comparisons between the two, but I think Peter B. Parker's is balanced a lot better, whereas I think Thor, his plotline is played a little bit too much for base level jokes and he's designed to be a punchline. Whereas Peter B. Parker, I think it balances the depression and the humor far better. And I absolutely loved where they kind of ended his character as he jumped into the portal at the end. And of course, you gotta talk about Miles Morales that I think he just won us over so quickly right there in his room singing along to his headphones. And then throughout the film, they just made him such an endearing character and he's so much like classic Spider-Man but also totally different in other ways and it all kind of paid off for me. It's a unique film, it's different, and it has everything that I want from a Spider-Man film. But coming in at first place is Spider-Man. I'm a sucker for an origin story and Sam Raimi gave us such a classic traditional take on the Spider-Man origin story. It hits all the right notes for me but at the same time it has so many Sam Raimi distinctive sprinkled throughout it that while it's very traditional, it also has a distinct unique flavor to it that tastes like something that Raimi cooked up. Spider-Man, of course, has one of the classic comic book origin stories, and we get a real straightforward version of it here, in which case you get all of the kind of greatest hits of Spider-Man, the with great power comes great responsibility. You get the wrestling match, you get the death of Uncle Ben, you get the trying out different superhero costumes, and you get him becoming Spider-Man. Add to the mix, I think Willem Dafoe is a fantastic villain here because he's a guy that just slowly is driven mad by his technology as the movie takes place over a good amount of time. And so you see him as the driven father, the person that's impressed by Peter. And then you see kind of as the insanity takes over and Willem Dafoe can do bonkers crazy and you get to see it on full display here. And finally, you have Danny Elfman's phenomenal score. It is absolutely one of the iconic superhero themes, one of the best of all time. Put it all together and you have a fantastic film. Now, all five of the top five here, I think are incredibly entertaining films. But for me, because it's an origin story, because it's such a classic version of the Spider-Man story, this one has a special place in my heart and it comes in at number one. Remember to check out that video right over there where I talk about the eight Spider-Man movies that almost happened. I literally spent about a year prepping this video. I'm so proud of it. I hope you check it out. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much.